Yes, welcome back to Home Studio Q&A here on Studio Live today, episode 44. We've been doing this caper for quite a while now. My name is Pete. This is Studio Live today, where my goal is to help you create, record, and release your best music. And we do that through tips, tricks, tutorial videos, and uh, yeah, a whole bunch of other stuff, including live shows just like this one. If that's your bag and you're not already subscribed, consider subscribing. In this one, I'll be answering a bunch of your questions, both live here on Facebook and YouTube, as well as from questions that have come in during the week. And uh, I'll also be covering a feature topic, which we'll be jumping into in just a moment, which is music lessons. Are they important? I'd love to get your feedback on this. So this is my question of the day, which we'll be talking about throughout, which is, are formal lessons important? So if you've, got a, if you've got a view on that, uh, feel free to let me know, either here live, if you are here live on Facebook or YouTube, or in the comments, or shoot me an email, or a carrier pigeon, uh, or smoke signals, uh, whatever you can do. Any way you can get your message through, do it. But uh, for now, why don't we jump in to this topic of the week. Should you take formal music lessons? It's a question that I get asked a lot, that I've thought about a lot, and like most things in music and in life, the answer is a big fat, it depends, because different strokes for different folks. Some people take music lessons and think they are super important and super valuable. Others take formal music lessons and find them not as useful. So what I thought I would do is dive into my view on one of the five best things about taking music lessons, the five things that are perhaps not so good, and then what are some alternatives? So let's explore these here together in this video. So what is good? What's good? What's good about taking formal music lessons? Now, when I say formal music lessons, it can be instruments, it can be lessons about recording, it can be one-on-one -on -one coaching about engineering or recording, whatever it is, we're talking a formal, you're paying a person, that person is giving you formal lessons. The goods, you can learn music theory. So music theory is important. It's sometimes underrated and sometimes overrated. It's one of those things that's weird. It sits in the middle there. Some people think that you need music theory to create music. I believe you don't. Some people think you don't need music theory at all and it's completely irrelevant. I don't agree with that either. I think it sits somewhere in the middle. I think you can create music without knowing much about music theory or anything about music theory, but it can help you. It can help you learn about different notes and how they work together, learn about chords and chord progressions and triads and one, four, fives and all of that sort of stuff. It can all actually help you out. But how much you need is kind of up to the individual. So, that, but it is a definitely a good thing to know theory. I've never known anyone that said, now that I know a heap about music theory, my music is worse. Maybe that happens occasionally, but I think it's pretty cool. The other good thing is you can learn the language of music. So you can learn about how to talk about music with other people. And it can just help shortcut the process. So instead of you saying, oh, I need, I, I, I've got a song and I want it to sound like sad and creepy, you can say, oh, I'm going to use a bunch of minor chords in this tune. Or instead of having to say, oh, I want this to sound like this, but I want that top note just to come down a little bit to give it that suspense, you can say, I'm thinking of using a major seventh or a seventh chord in this progression. So it just, again, it gives you the language of music that can help, especially when you're working and collaborating with others. You can learn the correct technique. Now, this is something that I have found uh, that I don't have. So I, don't, I didn't learn the correct technique when it came to learning guitar. I'm self-taught, 100% self-taught with guitar. And I'm finding now in my 40s that that's actually having its toll because I don't hold the guitar correctly. I don't use the right fingers on the right chords. And that actually limits my ability. If I had spent even a year getting some formal training, learning how I should do things, maybe I'd still do things differently. And again, this is we'll talk about this a bit later, but I would have at least had the grounding. Uh, I, I compare it to, to touch typing. So I learned how to touch type when I was in high school and then when I was doing my studies, like early on in life. And that's a skill that I'm... I'm just telling my children, look, seriously, let's sit down and spend 40 hours just learning to touch type because 40 hours is like a week's worth of time, full-time time, but you'll use that forever. And I mean, I don't think the keyboard's going away. I know we've got touch screens and things now, but I think the physical QWERTY keyboard is still going to be a fundamental part of everything we do. And again, learning the correct technique has really helped me with that. Uh, number four, 
You can learn how music is constructed. So by getting formal training, formal feedback, you can learn about how things work together and playing other people's songs and other pieces and some of the classical composers, if you're learning something like piano, can actually really help you because you'll learn a lot of tools and techniques and tricks that they use in their song composition and their songwriting process that will actually help you with your own creation. So learning the guts, the bones of music and how it all comes together is important and getting direct feedback. Yeah, super underrated. Getting direct feedback from one person that is watching you do a thing. It's kind of like the personal trainer thing. You can go into a gym and lift weights and do it all completely wrong and then go, why don't I have the guns? And then a personal trainer will grab you and go, because instead of going, uh, 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 what you actually have to do is do it slowly up and slowly down because that's how you actually engage the muscle. So things like that, when it comes to music, having that one-on-one -on -one training from someone who knows their stuff is very important. What's not so good? So what's, what's bad about doing one-on-one -on -one training? You might think, oh, is there anything bad about this? Well, there's a few things. Number one is that one size does not fit all. But sometimes, sometimes, some music teachers are fabulous. Some music teachers will go and talk to the student, find out what motivates them, find out what makes them tick, and then they'll deliver a customized program. Other people will grab a Suzuki grade one book and say, let's go from start to finish, and I'm gonna teach you exactly the way that I've taught every other piano student for the last 30 years. No, yeah, no surprises for guessing which, which way I think people should go. I don't like structured education for that very reason that it is one size fits all. And everyone is different. People have different learning styles and people have different goals and ambitions. If I went and learned guitar right now, that teacher would need to teach me a lot of different things than if I was a brand, if I was a 12 year old picking up a guitar for the very first time. So yes, one size does not fit all. Now it can give a negative perception of music. And uh, I hear this from other people and you know I go through this with my kids and other people that I talk to that if you push too hard to do something, you know, you, you heard of these kids that, you know, they start at age four and they play the violin and they're like a complete virtuoso by age 12, but they absolutely hate and resent every moment of it. And then as soon as the parents take their foot off, as soon as they become a teenager and old enough to make their own choices, they chuck it away and they just go out and party and drink because they've spent all of this time doing something. And yeah, they're good at it. They're great at it. They're technically proficient, but they don't have the passion for it because they've been pushed so hard and forced into doing something that it actually gives them a negative perception of music. So balancing out that training with having fun and, uh, and exploring your creativity, which is the next point here. It can stifle creativity. Again, good teachers will open up the gates and will give you the tools to open up your creativity, not close it off. But I have seen some teachers who do the opposite where um, the kid will be playing around and they'll be like, hey, I, I wrote a cool new song and they'll go and play it to the teacher. And they're like, oh, that, enough of that fun and games. Let's sit down here and like learn your scales. Scales are important, but they're also boring as balls. So when you want to actually do something fun and utilize what you're learning with your music in a creative way, I think a good teacher will actually encourage that as well. You are trusting one person's experience or opinion. Now, I've kind of covered this in some of the other things we've talked about, but yeah, you are, you, you are basically taking on board one person's experience and feedback, which is okay if that person's experience and feedback aligns with you, your goals, your style, and your ambitions. If it doesn't, there's a risk there again that you're going to be pushed into something that you don't want to do, that doesn't align with what your ambitions actually are, and then you're trusting that person's opinion. So you may go in there and say, hey, I want to, I want to play this, and I want to play this, and I want to do some jazz piano, and they're like, again, they just sit down and go, bang, Suzuki, volume one, and they, they teach you that method. Might not work for you. Might not align with your skills and your ambitions, so uh, keep that in mind. And number five, yes, the, the finger thing means the money. Yeah, it does cost. So it is an investment in yourself to actually use a one-on-one -on -one teacher. Is it a bad investment? Well, no. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the, the poll, which I'll tell you about at the end of this uh, little section, uh, says that most people that do music get value out of it. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, cover that in a moment. But yeah, I don't think, it's, don't think it's sort of throwing good money after bad to do formal music lessons. But again, it's about finding the right teacher that's going to teach you the right stuff. 
Now, you know what I'm going to jump into now. What are the alternatives? If you don't want to use a one-on-one -on -one formal teacher, what can you do? Well, there's a few things. There are paid learning platforms. So one of my favorites at the moment, and yes, this is a, uh, an affiliate of the channel, but I've used it for year, like over a year before I became an affiliate, and that is a masterclass. So you can go to studiolivetoday.com slash masterclass. You pay a yearly subscription, you learn from the best. But here's the good thing, you're not learning from one teacher, you're learning from a bunch. So I've taken courses from Sheila E on percussion, from Hans Zimmer on composing, Tom Morello on guitar. Uh, what's the one I'm about to do now? Uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Danny Elfman, the, the, the Simpsons music dude. Uh, yeah, there's a, a heap of different people and you're learning a bunch of stuff from a bunch of different perspectives. I think it's pretty cool. You can also go to paid online courses. Now, I'm not saying this because I have one, because I don't right now. <laughs> I'm not selling a course, but plenty of folks do. And there's a lot of good online courses that can help you, whether you're going to learn guitar or piano, learn how to record, learn how to use software. There's a heap of those. There's also, in the paid side, there's paid forums and support groups. So you can join up, pay a monthly fee. Joe Gilder has his VIP club that you pay, like $10, $30 a month, something. Uh, some people like Warren Hewitt, Produce Like a Pro, they have their academy where you can join that and you can have have the sort of guidance from a bunch of different people. Now, what if, you know, the finger thing means money, what if you don't want to spend the cash? Well, obviously there's free forums and support groups. So again, I'm super duper biased, uh, but the Facebook group that we have, that's the uh, official Studio Live Today Facebook group, it's called Create, Record, Release. That is uh, what I would recommend. And there's a heap of others too. You can join Reddit forums, you can join uh, particular websites that I don't like the names of, I won't mention, but you know the ones we're talking about. And of course, Facebook groups and other places that you can interact with other musicians and learn from other people. And last but not least, I mean, you're looking at it, right? It's free online training. It's using things like YouTube and YouTube videos to actually learn how to do things. And don't, estra uh, don't underestimate that, that, the power of YouTube. Uh, my coffee machine wasn't grinding up the beans like a, a couple of months ago. And I went onto YouTube and I went, uh, how to fix bean grinder not working on DeLonghi coffee machine. And got a video, watched it for five minutes and it fixed it. So that's obviously a very short version of learning how to do something. I now know how to adjust the grinder settings on my coffee machine. But again, if I wanted to learn how to use a software application, how to play guitar, then you, there are a bunch of places with free online training that you can actually go to that can help you out. Uh, what about that poll? Uh, let's just check in and so that if you were not on that, so if you're on the community tab on Studio Live today, you would have seen this poll result already, but let's just take a look at this before we finish up this section. So I asked the question, have you taken formal music lessons from a one-on-one -on -one teacher in your life and did it help your music creation? 29% of people said a yes, they did, and it helped a lot. Now, keep in mind, 45% of people haven't taken formal lessons. So of the 55% who have, 29% said it helped a lot, 11% said it helped somewhat, 8% said it helped a little, and 7% said it had no impact. So only 7% out of 55%, so only like one in 10-ish people, uh, seemed to think that it had no impact at all. Everyone else said it had at least some sort of positive impact. So there you go. What do you think about formal coaching, formal training? Uh, that is what I would like to hear from you. So if you have your own feedback on that, then uh, go ahead and throw that down in the comments here and uh, we will get to that. Uh, Jeff Brush, for instance, says, uh, says, I think it's good to learn guitar or piano where you can learn the chords, etc. I learned trombone and brass instruments, which was good, but I only learned the bass clef and single lines. Yeah, that's a good point. Piano is kind of like the ultimate teaching tool because you have the two clefts, you learn all the notes, you learn all the chords, you learn all the things. If you're learning one instrument, yeah, you learn like how to tune four strings and then how to play single notes on a single staff. It cannot be as good. Um, yeah, and Tom Rochelle says a really good point here. The tough part is finding a teacher that vibes with you. That can take time, money, and patience. Absolutely appreciate that uh, for, for, for sure. Um, cool. Uh, so Jade says, uh, Jade says, I always start the first two lessons the same. I may do a show on it on how, how to app if people are interested. Uh, I'm, I'm, that might have been related to something else that was said there as well. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's some really good points being made here. So thank you everyone for, uh, for providing your feedback here. And uh, <laughs> Darren Daniluk says, uh, um, uh, post chords, if only someone showed me power chords. I know, how long, it took me a long time to work out that power chords were the, all I needed, especially writing a 90s alternative rock. Uh, I was like, oh, so all you need is three notes and then you've got a really cool chord and it sounds awesome. Yeah, 
Totally. All righty, let's jump in and start uh, taking uh, taking some questions here. Oh, one final note here. Absolutely agree with this one. Dan Baker's channel is awesome for learning to read music. Yeah, Dan Baker, if you don't know Dan Baker, he's one of the channels, the supported channels here. If you go to the list of, uh, of the About section of Studio Live today, uh, he has some really cool sort of more in-depth stuff. So he teaches, I think he's got some videos on like the caged method for, for guitar. He talks about the circle of fifths. He talks about a bunch of music theory and theoretical stuff. Uh, and because he is a, he is a, a t music examiner, so uh, he knows his stuff. He's not just, uh, you know, some some middle-aged dude on YouTube just sprouting out what he thinks and his opinions. He actually knows his stuff. Uh, so, yeah, do check out Dan Baker. Uh, and I agree with you, Gary Hubbs. I might consider taking singing lessons eventually. Me too. Um, yeah, I, I, ever since I had uh, Beth Rawls uh, on the channel, I did an interview with her several months ago. I've been thinking since I need to do some uh, music, some singing lessons because I never have and uh, it could only help, right? Uh, according to, you know, 90% of people, it's going to help me at least a bit, if not a lot. So why not? Cool, cool. Uh, righty go, okay. Let's, uh, let's answer some questions here. Question from Roo Roo. Uh, it says, question, whenever I want to export my GarageBand track on GarageBand iPad to Wave, it always exports to MP4A rather than Wave, though I choose to export to Wave. Why is this? That is very weird uh, because when I've exported, it works fine. So why don't we, since we've got uh, we've got my screen set up here, why don't I bring up my iPad and we'll just do a very quick demo. I'm just going to bring up the iPad and pop it over on the screen so that we can show you this. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. I need I need a way to have my iPad and my iPhone both on the screen at one time, but I can only share one at a time or I get super confused. But let's bring this up. There it is. Uh, we'll come back here. We'll go into Garage Band. So what you're saying is here, why does it export as MP, M4A rather than Wave? So uh, I'll just pop your comment to the side for now. So if I was to uh, export a song here, so say I want to export my song, Timber song here, what I would do is I'd tap Select. I'd select on that one there. I would come down here to bottom left and go Share. And then what you're saying is when you go song uh, here, this is the section where you need to choose it. So you don't want to choose any of these. These will all be M4A, the first four. These second three are all your lossless. So you've got Apple lossless, AIF or Wave. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. I just use Wave for compatibility. And then I'll hit share. And then it'll pop up here. It'll say where you want to share it to. You've got to use open in. Maybe this is part of the issue. So there's a bug at the moment that you need to firstly hit the open in button. That's going to export the song and then it's going to ask you what you want to do with it and then it will save it as the proper file. So perhaps this might be related. There is a bug, as I said, that's happening at the moment that uh, you do need to, if you just do save to file straight away instead of open in, it won't actually work for you. So we'll let this, uh, we'll let this finish off and then uh, we'll make sure that uh, it is going to work. I'll show you how that comes. And while I do that, I'll take a look and see if we've got any other questions uh, that folks have put in here. If you do, have a question pop question in front of your question that just makes it easier for me to find with all of the other uh, chat that goes on here uh, that will make life a lot easier for me so uh, thank you for that I'm scrolling on up and I don't see any other questions apart from this one from Roo Roo uh, it's taking a long time to export <laughs> Jay was doing this during the week on her how to app series and usually when you get to about this point of an export um, it usually means that it's going to pop up and say uh, your, your audio unit extension quit and it doesn't export it properly but no this one seems to have worked it just faked me out there a little bit so now we would either, we'd save to files so you go that save to files and what we'll see here hopefully when it pops up it's being extra slow because it knows it's being watched. No, no, what is it? A watched pot never boils. There you go. So now we can just save it. And there you can see it's a WAV file. I'll just save it here in my GarageBand folder like that. And then if we come out here to my GarageBand folder, go to files, zoomp, go to our files here. Uh, I think, did I save it to my, on my GarageBand location there? Uh, blah, 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 blah. There it is. So there it is. 68 megabytes of goodness. That is my wave file. So there you go. Now you can utilize that with whatever you want. Uh, if we go to the info just to confirm. There you go. Wave form audio wave file. All good in the hood. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that helps you and anyone else having exporting issues. Uh, it'll actually help you out. Now I did have a question here from Ricky, which is a good question. How do you know if your song is ready to be uploaded? How do you know if a song's finished? When is it done? When do you know that it's done? 
I've had this question a lot. I've heard this question answered by folks that are much more experienced than I am at recording. And the answer is you don't. The answer is you just feel that it's there or you don't. But this is why I use something I call positive time pressure. This is why I do things like song timber, which we're doing, can't see it, song timber. This is why I do things like song, song timber, which is that it gives you a set time period. Because uh, have you ever heard that sort of the expression that, you know, that work will expand to fill the amount of time that you have? This is why things like that Guns N' Roses album took like 15 years to make. Uh, was that Chinese democracy? It's because they never said it was going to be done by this day. And there's, there's, there's some people that will say, well, you can't rush art. Well, no, you can't. But you also can't sit on the same stuff forever because at some point it becomes diminishing levels of returns. And that's the sort of thing that I think that, you, you, and I think Jade said this before as well and others have said this, you are always going to look back on the things that you finish and release and think, I could have done this, I could have done that. I'm sure that the best top selling recording artists of all time look back on some of their songs and go, gee, I really wish I'd hit that note a little better. I really wish I'd put a different chord there instead of that one. So I say all that to say, I think at some point you just have to go, yep, this is the best I can do without beating this dead horse, without actually spending all of my life trying to get perfection. Because perfection, A, doesn't exist, and B, is subjective. So when you put it in those terms, get it as close to the hole as you can, and then just walk away and clo just cl close in on your next song. Because you've always got, again, you've got unlimited retries. You can just keep creating more songs and more music. This isn't your one shot. I always say, Eminem had it wrong. When he said uh, in 8 Mile, you've got one shot. It's like, no, you don't have one shot. You've got unlimited shots. Just keep going. It's not like you get this one chance to get in front of the big record exec and then if this one song isn't perfect, then you never get another opportunity again. Uh -uh. 2020, doesn't work like that. Uh, we have control. You have control. So set yourself a date. Set yourself a date in a week's time. Say, I'm going to finish it by that. Whatever you've got done in a week's time, that's your finished song. Sounds simple but it works in my experience, in my experience, in my opinion. Uh, any other questions uh, for, that we have before we continue on? Uh, <laughs> Russ says uh, it's, it's never finished. Uh, it's, it's what we'll do. Yeah, exactly. You're ne never going to get there. Never going to get there. Uh, Gary said, I thought it was because Axel was an a-hole um, or is an a-hole. Well, yeah, there, there's a little bit of that too. Uh, that was a Guns N' Roses reference, in case you're wondering. Yeah. Uh, yes. All right. Let's continue on. Um, okay. Oh, here we go. So uh, Jade Star says, actually, I will do on tomorrow's How to App Show what I normally teach on your first singing lesson. There you go. Uh, if you want to learn more about lessons, uh, Jade Star is going to take the ball. I've handballed it to her. She's going to run in and kick a gorgeous drop punt from 50 metres out straight through the uprights. That'll make sense to maybe two or three people. Um, do, 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 do. and Ruru, we've got success here. Just tried the method you show on how you exported and it worked. Thanks. Beautiful. Glad to hear it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Jade says, I need to take my own advice uh, on my main Dread Circus album. It's taken seven years to create 22 tracks on my new album, which is almost finished. I've aimed to finish it by January. Uh, but here's the thing, Jade. In the meantime, you've pumped out, what, 30-odd tracks in that seven years as well? Like Probably more than that, probably 40, 50. So, yeah, uh, and that can be the case. Maybe you are working on your, uh, what's that thing that writers have? Their um, momentous, no, no, there's a word for it. Um, Someone's going to correct me. You, that thing that you do, but you still do other things at the, at the same time. So maybe that's a thing. If you are finding you can't finish a song, maybe move off and do something different. Do something completely different and then come back to that one when you have some time. That's an option as well. All right, we'll jump over to the questions that have come in through the week. And then uh, if anyone else here live has any questions, uh, we can jump back to those because we do need to finish on time today because we have a double header happening. I'm actually doing a live show, some live music going on uh, straight after this one. So uh, in 30 minutes time. So I need to take myself uh, a five or 10 minute break and then come back and do uh, not the happy hour, but the, the coffee hour. So what I'll be doing is I'll be going and making a coffee. Instead of grabbing a beer, I'll be grabbing a coffee today and we'll be doing some uh, we'll be doing some cover tunes. And I've got a little bit of a surprise in how we're going to do the cover tunes today. It's a little concept I've been working on. So there you go. That's a tease. You'll find out at the end of this video what I mean and what that's all about and what sort of fun we're going to be having there. But for now, why don't we jump over and take a look at some of the questions from the week. So let's bring up my screen. Here we go. 
So I did a video a while ago. I've done a few videos on using a mixer for live streams. I'm using a mixer right now. I love my mixer. I have the Samson, as you can see on that, that uh, image there. That was me showing my Samson mix pad, which I think is still a very solid mixer. It's sitting behind me over there. I need to do something with it. I need to, 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 uh, to sell it or put it to use somewhere in the studio because uh, it's no good me just having this extra gear when some people have no gear. That doesn't make sense. So uh, question here, this sounds helpful, but what could you advise for a small church YouTube live broadcast? broadcast. Our sound quality is not that cool. Yeah, so I, I actually, this has inspired me to do a video on this at some stage soon because I get asked this by a lot of people that uh, they're doing, especially at the moment, and I, I, basically, I didn't want to jump on this bandwagon because I, I, I'm so conscious of not being exploitative of world situations. I hate people that just jump on trends for trend's sake and go, oh, now I can just leverage this disaster for my own personal gain. But I get asked this question enough that I should probably answer it a bit better in a video. But a lot of folks want to stream decent quality. They've already got maybe some gear, but they don't have the know-how of how to actually get the quality going on. So when you're talking either using a laptop or using an iPhone or an iPad, the actual built-in audio quality is not going to be fabulous, but there's some quick and easy and effective ways to get some better audio quality going on. So the first thing you can think about is using a mixer. So plugging a mixer into either your iPhone or iPad or into your Mac or PC, it means that you can <clears throat> you can route any instruments. So if you're doing microphones, if you're delivering sermons or doing voiceovers or whatever, you can do that. If you're playing music and you've got a band and you've got a bunch of instruments or you've got a PA that you're playing live, you can pump the PA out and send a stereo PA signal into your mixer mixer as well, mix that in with your own voiceover and your own other bits and pieces, add in an, you know, an MP3 player, MP3 player, add in a phone uh, as an audio source if you want to play along to some recorded music. So a mixer is actually, you know, it's the Swiss army knife of live streaming out of any sort of live music stuff because you just throw your sources at it, you mix it all on the fly, you send out a nice clean stereo signal. So that's definitely a way if you're not going down that track, you can use things like microphones, like USB microphones. You can use mobile microphones like the Shure MV88 that I recommend and use a lot. That's really cool if you just want a quick and easy setup on your phone. You can use little things like the Roland Go Mixer that I've uh, I've reviewed here on the channel as well. So there's a heap of ways to get some good sound. What I think I need to do is sit down and actually go through those in detail to actually uh, spell them all out for folks. But if you do want to check out what I recommend and what I use, that's where to go, studiolivetoday.com slash gear. That's got all of my gear recommendations. So if you ever have a question say, I wonder what blah Pete uses, then uh, by all means ask me. I'll still tell you, but I'll probably also point you there to studiolivetoday.com slash gear because I've spent hours and hours curating that, making sure I've got all the links to all the different sites. I've got links to video reviews about all the different things. And that is the one stop shop for your gear needs on the internet. Let's move on, shall we? Question from, not Nick Penn, uh, but Nice Penn. Hello, Nice Penn. Uh, says, hi, Pete. Thanks for your tutorials. I'm a beginner. I have a question. I'm able to record guitar and vocals recorded separately are sounding okay. However, I don't see any waveform of both. I'm using Audio-Technica USB mic to iPad mini. Thanks again for your help. So, yeah, the answer to this is probably the answer that I had to work out when I first started. And it generally comes down to something called input gain. So you may be aware that there's two different types of gain when you're recording. There's your input gain and your output gain. So your output gain is just the volume knob. So that's just the level that things are going to be playing, playing back in your headphones, playing back on your speakers. The input gain, however, is different. The input gain actually sets how much of the sound is being picked up, how much is being sent in to your recording software. And what a lot of folks do when they first start out is they'll they'll hear their sound, so they'll think the input gain set okay, and they'll record it too quietly. Weirdly and conversely, another group of people turn it up to 11 because they want to hear it really loud. And instead of turning up their output gain, they turn up their input gain and then they start clipping. So they get their recordings too loud. What you actually want is it to be right in that middle zone. So here's the things. If you record too quietly, what happens is you don't see those waveforms. You'll hear it, but it'll be really low down, which means it's going to be much harder to edit. And you're probably not getting enough volume through, which means that if you then have to turn it up, you might pull up some of the noise that's in the signal. You want to turn it up to a level where you're balancing between having it too low and then hitting what we call the noise floor. 
So if you turn it up too high, on the other hand, you're going to get nice, healthy, chunky waveforms. But if you really dig in on a guitar chord or you really belt out a vocal, what's going to happen is your waveform is going to go up and peak and do what we call clipping. Digital clipping is evil. It's the worst thing because you can't fix it. There is no way to fix digital clipping because what digital clipping means is that there's information that's come in there that hasn't been recorded. You've gone too loud and it's clipped it. It's cut it off. You can't get that back. If you turn it down, it's still going to be peaking and maximized. You're missing information. You can't bring it back together. Um, so yeah, they're the sort of two things. My guide is 50 to 75%. So you want it probably closer to the 50, definitely not over the 75%. You want to give yourself some room at the top end of that input gain meter to make sure that if you do go a little louder, you are not going to clip. At the bottom end, if you go less than 50%, it's just a practical thing that it's going to be hard to see those waveforms. So I think it's that on your USB mic, you'd just have a gain dial you'd turn up. If you're using software, there's the gain dial on your actual software. If you're using an audio interface, you'll have your input gain for your interface. So hopefully that helps you out and anyone else who has similar questions, because I do get that a lot. Most people saying it's too quiet, it's too, uh, it's too high. Um, either either, you probably need to work it out and get it somewhere in between. Uh, and uh, thank you to Jade, who said, uh, yes, check out my gear recommendations. Uh, they are affiliate links, so they will break off a small chunk and send it to me, which is 100% true. Um, oh, we've got, uh, so, so Jade said uh, he spent a couple of days helping my mate set up his new Steinberg UR22C via a Mac. Uh, he couldn't get Reaper uh, or GarageBand to recognize it. Eventually, I got him to reinstall the drivers, uh, and it finally worked. Yeah, so if you, if you do have that same issue, uh, th there's two things you do. <laughs> so if you're on a mobile device, close all your apps, turn it completely off, turn it completely back on again, plug back in, and... Honestly, eight times out of 10, that probably works. It's just something in, I don't even know what it is, but something's going on that's not letting your stuff connect. Also make sure you're using a genuine Apple Lightning to USB adapter if you're on an iPhone, because that's the main core of the problems. But on a Mac or a PC, yeah, again, same deal. Close all your apps, turn it off, turn it back on again. If that doesn't work, go find the latest version of the driver software. And what I do, what I do and recommend is remove all of the old versions of everything. So if you've, if you've installed a default driver, or if Windows has just grabbed a default driver, remove any software or drivers that you can see there, reinstall the latest new package that puts all the stuff in there. I had to do this with my printer recently. It's a pain in the butt, but it works. And then it just, it will, it will, it will work seamlessly after that. So uh, turn it off and on and drivers. They're my two things. Uh, Russ has said, oh, Dan Baker did a, a show about recording levels today. Yeah. And you can go, you know, you can go down the rabbit hole. You can talk about uh, gain staging and you can talk like there's a lot of detail that you can go into. I like to keep it simple. If you're setting input gain 50 to 75 percent, that's all that most people need to know about it. But yeah, there's a bunch of other things you can learn about noise floor and learn about over and under doing it. And yeah, Dan Baker's probably got a super detailed video with a lot of cool information. I'll definitely be checking that one out uh, later in the day. Let's continue on. Uh, we've got some more questions to get to that folks have been uh, dropping in here. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, this is a video of recording without a click track. Uh, and we've got a, a question here. Even if I turn off the metronome, it keeps sounding what to do. <laughs> so if you turn off the metronome and you're hearing a metronome, what has probably happened is what we call mic bleed. So microphone bleed, if you're recording something like a vocal or a guitar or something that's a live instrument as opposed to a MIDI instrument or a virtual instrument, it can sometimes pick up some of the sound of your metronome or some of the sound of the drums or some of the sound of the guitars. It's not inherently a bad thing, but it can be annoying and frustrating, especially when you don't know what's causing it. The main cause of that is that when you're recording, even when you're recording with some headphones, like some nice headphones like the Sennheiser HD280 Pros that are closed back, meaning they don't allow a lot of noise to come out, there's still some noise that comes out. And because most people are using a condenser microphone like this one, this picks up a lot of detail. So this picks up a lot of detail in the room. If I go quiet, and you've got your volume up loud enough, you can hear like the background noise. You'll probably hear a bus go past. You'll hear some birds tweeting outside. So yeah, it's going to pick up a lot of noise and it's definitely going to pick up a little bit, especially if you've got a loud... You've got that loud metronome sound. And that's why I recommend a couple of things. Turn down your metronome, first and foremost. Turn it just up to just loud enough so that you can hear it, so that you can play along and be in the, be in the pocket. 
or do what I do. Turn off the metronome entirely and record to a drum track. And record to a drum track that's going to be the drum track or at least a similar drum track to what's going to be in your final song. That way, you don't have to worry about the click track because you're not going to use a click track. And if you do get some bleed, well, it's going to sound quite natural because your vocals will just have a teensy bit of the drum track or the guitar track or the actual backing track. And you know what? Once you blend those in and once you've got 20 and 30 tracks rocking together, you barely notice it. In fact, sometimes it adds a little bit of something. It adds a little bit of room noise. And it's actually kind of cool because it can make it sound more like you're actually cohesively playing with the band because that's how stuff used to be recorded. They used to get a bunch of musicians together. As soon as multi-tracking was, was invented, they went, excellent. Now... Everyone in the band can actually play together and we can record them all separately and then mix them afterwards. And they accepted the fact that there was going to be bleed between the drums and the bass and the bass and the keys and the keys and the vocals, but they just went, oh, well, that's that's just part of it. We, we want to get a nice groove going on. That's how we're going to record. It wasn't until they went, oh, what if we just do it one by one that they went, oh, now we have to worry about the bleed coming from the headphones, etc. But yeah, uh, that's uh, that's my two cents on that one, but hopefully that helps you out. Uh, Jade Star says... Uh, check out Dan Baker's channel. Yeah, definitely do go over and check out Dan Baker's channel on YouTube. Uh, again, when I grow up, I want to be Dan Baker, except I don't because the amount of effort I'd have to go to to <laughs> learn all the things he knows. Uh, yeah, the dude, the dude knows his stuff. There's an inspiration to those of us who are, who are creating music as well. Uh, question here from E... Now, you're going to have to tell me one day, Eves, Ives, uh, I need to, <laughs> there's so many different pronunciations of different names. What do I think about the Behringer X18, uh, X18 Air Digital? So I haven't actually played around with the Behringer, uh, with Behringer stuff a lot at all. I have a Behringer UM2, like the absolute entry level interface, because I wanted to test it out. Because a lot of people come to me and they say, what is the cheapest, absolute cheapest mic preamp and interface that I can use? And I say the Behringer UM2, so I've tried that out. The Behringer uh, X Series mixes and and the Air Series in particular have some really cool features, but I've just never dived into them enough to actually work out what they do. Uh, so yeah, and they have they seem to have some pretty high end, high level features, especially for the price that you pay for them. So I, I, my, my short answer is, I don't know because I haven't tried them. I know people that use them and that like them and apparently they're class compliant. They work nicely with your iOS devices as well. Might be a question for someone like the uh, the iPad Musician Forum or uh, some of the other forums on, on Facebook or jump over to Create, Record, Release. Or if anyone else here is using uh, the Air, the X Series Air for Behringer, then uh, let us know, and uh, that would be cool. Um, <laughs> so Garrett, Gary says on the question of metronomes, uh, I almost had to add woodblock to a part of my parking lots to hide the metronome bleed. <laughs> so the scratch bass track was too good. I didn't dare touch it. Yeah, and that's the thing. And you know what? You might hear a tiny little bit of metronome in the song when you're listening back to it, but you can almost guarantee that no one else listening to it is. They're not listening for it, and if they hear it, they're probably not going to care. They're getting into the groove of the song, and that's the thing. Don't, don't spend too much time worrying about something like that when the end user, the end listener, is not going to be caring about it. I mean, if it bugs the crap out of you and you want to remove it to make yourself feel good, then go with that. But uh, yeah, don't spend a heap of time worrying about it too much. <clears throat> All right, we are coming towards the end. Why don't we grab one more question here from the through the week, and then we'll uh, we'll finish things off. Uh, Eve, okay, pronounced like Eve, excellent. So now, whenever I see Y V E S, I'm going to go with Eve. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I thought that might be the case because I know that in in some countries and some nationalities, a lot of silent letters and things going on. Uh, but yeah, then then sometimes I get it completely wrong. So there you go, Eve. Uh, I don't know, but yeah, it's something I do want to look into the Behringer stuff because again, it's a pretty good bang for buck from what I've seen. Uh, let's finish off with this question uh, from Auto La Vista. It says uh, this was about connecting a USB audio interface to an iPad or iPhone. Can I record a video with a video camera on iPhone with these settings? but I want to record it at the same time while I record the audio. Now, I get asked questions about this a lot. For people that want to uh, record video and then record audio. Now, I haven't come across a good way to do this. To be honest, the way that I do this, if I want to say record some GarageBand audio and I want to record video with my camera, is I record the audio onto my iPad, I record the video with my iPhone, and then I put them together in editing because I haven't found a way to get good quality audio going through. Uh, through my iPhone or through my iPad and then be able to record it as audio 
and as video at the same time. If anyone has any ideas on this, please let me know. I did find something cool recently, which I need to do a video on, and that is that I didn't realize this, but the real-time effects that you get as part of the Steinberg UR series, UR44s and the UR22Cs and others, you can actually record through them in iOS. I thought that was only a PC and a Mac feature, but there's an app that you can actually dial in. I've been watching the Steinberg videos lately, so you can dial in real-time effects using the built-in effects there, still do latency-free monitoring and push that through as your audio. So I'm definitely going to have to try doing some live music stuff with my mic and my uh, guitar going through the Steinberg UR22C and then pushing that out to, uh, to a live stream or to my camera app or something to try that out. But in order to answer this question, no, I haven't found a way. Basically, as soon as you are recording audio, you're not recording video. I mean, you are, but if you want to record through the effects and you want to add things, you want to record audio in your GarageBand or another app, then it's. I don't believe you can record the video side at the same time. Uh, hopefully that uh, that helps you out. Well, it doesn't really, but hopefully that answers your question there at least. All righty, we are, we are here at the end of the show. Uh, so I hope you got some value out of this one. Thanks everyone for your questions. Uh, hopefully the, the rant about the music lessons inspired you either to go away and take some music lessons or maybe not to. <laughs> either way, uh, we, we do live in the future. The beautiful thing about 2020 is that you have, I know not many people have said sentences that start with the beautiful thing about 2020, but I'm going to do one. The beautiful thing about 2020 or the future in general is that we have choices. So as I mentioned before, you don't have one shot. You don't have to go on the talent show and if Simon Cowell, you need Simon Cowell to like you in order to be successful. A, because your measure of success is going to vary for different people and B, because you just don't need the infrastructure anymore. This creates a really great opportunity because the barrier to entry is lower and everyone has a shot. This also creates some overcrowding because the barrier to entry is low and everyone has a shot. But the beautiful part is that the market decides. And by the market, I just mean people that are going to listen to your music. And you will find your tribe. You will find people that like what you do, that dig your vibe, and that you get along with. Um, I was talking yesterday about slaps.com. I'm finding some people who are my tribe, who are my vibe, uh, that I really vibe with. And just experimenting and listening to other people's music can be a great way to actually do that. So for, for you, if you're sitting out there and you're like, what do I do? What's my next step? I know it's cliched. I know I've said it a bunch, but the best way to start is to start. It's to hit record and start recording. It's to put out your first live stream video. Uh, I'm, I'm super proud of, of Tom. So Tom here on the live stream, Thomas Christ, he's done three, maybe four live streams now. And it, it's very reminiscent. I, I remember when I first started out, you, you were, you're doing a live stream. There's, you know, maybe three or four people that you're, you're playing to live. And it can be, it can be a little disheartening. I'm going to be honest. But when I first started doing this, same deal. Yeah, I had a hundred people subscribed to the channel. There'd be a couple of people watching at any time but then people start watching the replays and then people start digging what you're doing and then over time you'll find the people and again it's it, it, it's not about the vanity metrics and the numbers i don't want it, don't want you to think that that's the the main aim or the key here but it is it's, it's about just getting out there and doing it and the more you do it rinse repeat just keep doing it the better you get the more experience you get the more confidence you get and that is what translates into a community and, and people helping other people out. I know I got a little bit <laughs> a little bit uh, off track there at the end, but I, I know we talk about gear, we talk about techniques, we talk about a bunch of stuff. I do want to make sure that we bring it back to the fact that we all just have the ability to use what you have to create, record, release your best music, share it with the world, uh, be kind to yourself and to others and all those other cliched things that we say. What's happening from here? Well, guess what? I'm going to go make a coffee and in 10 minutes time, I'll be back sitting right here with that, <laughs> with my guitar in hand. And I did say I'd give you a little bit of info about what we're doing today. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, the human jukebox today. Um, I'm working on a concept where I want to have a list of songs and then folks can request songs. And we have a bit like a jukebox. So folks throw a, a small donation my way, uh, that goes into the kitty, and then I play a song that they choose from my list of songs. Uh, today, because I haven't given any warning and we're just testing out the theory, uh, I'll be using a random number generator. So just like a real 
jukebox. If no one has a request, no one puts any money in the slot. Uh, I've got a random number generator ready to go. So I'll be able to hit the button and use that uh, to, to determine the song. So that should be a bit of fun. Uh, please join me in, uh, in 10 minutes time uh, right here on the channel. You'll get the notification. You can jump straight back in for the coffee break, the, the happy hour this week happening early. Uh, I hope you can join me for that one. Uh, but until next time, uh, I will see you on the next video. Uh, again, be kind to yourself and to others. Keep creating, recording and releasing and I'll catch you real soon. See you.